So why don't we begin? Uh, this <laughs> is are some questions uh, about onshore jobs with offshore wind. Um, and I didn't number them, so we don't have to uh, investigate any one uh, in a particular order, although it would be good to start uh, with the first one. Uh, why does the United States need offshore wind power? Aren't there enough land-sided wind turbines that already exist? or will be built in the near future to meet our wind power needs? Well, onshore wind turbines. Uh, you can't build them everywhere. Uh, and you can't build offshore everywhere either but there's more space available offshore. And uh, there are companies in Maine that are vying for the offshore work when it comes five years from now. Uh, Chinbro, Bath Ironworks, and possibly read and read as uh, some support and maintenance. So, uh, why do we need offshore power? Well, we need everything we can get. Uh, and we need to be very frugal with what we have. The uh, report is out uh, that uh, oil has uh, been used up uh, or is being used up twice as fast as experts one th once thought. So the peak has been reached and it's all downhill from here. Uh, so people in Maine who heat their homes uh, with oil heat, and that's about 80% of us, are gonna be out of luck in 10 years. I learned that from Governor Angus King. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we, also, we just dodged a bullet of, what, $5 a gallon heating or 4 or $5 last winter. Thank God. But it's, recession. oil is gonna become really scarce. And com uh, countries are uh, lining up to uh, squeeze every last bit of oil out of the earth. Uh, they're looking uh, at the Arctic. Uh, Russia wants to build um, oil extraction uh, and refineries nuclear powered in the Arctic because the ice melt due to global warming due to using fossil fuel. So. When you talk about offshore wind power, are you also talking about the power of the waves? Yes, uh, the governor, Governor Baldacci, last uh, November uh, and December, signed into uh, effect the Ocean Energy Task Force, uh, which is looking at uh, all forms of uh, ocean energy, uh, and some of it is wave, and some of it is tidal, uh, and some of it is wind. And there are projects uh, in Eastport uh, going on right now with uh, tidal power, and uh, the United States Coast Guard is getting the benefit of uh, uh, prototype uh, tidal power uh, turbine. So. Does this mean that they might visit the Bay of Fundy? Well, Canada is looking at uh, the Bay of Fundy really hard. 
but I don't know if they're going to uh, uh, dam it off like they once proposed. There are other means out there. Uh, there are actual uh, uh, wave energy and tidal energy uh, that don't require uh, a head like a dam, a big reservoir of water. But uh, the tide flows over five knots, and that's enough to generate, uh, you know, ocean energy. So. There are also uh, environmental uh, considerations uh, to think of with producing energy. Uh, different forms of energy. We, we know that fossil fuels, uh, we haven't learned yet how to make them uh, carbon free, or we haven't done it anyway. Uh, there's a conversion coming uh, to uh, sustainable electric power generated from natural sources. Uh, the conversion in Maine will be to electric with uh, geothermal heat pumps, uh, different uh, electric stoves that uh, absorb energy and uh, transmit it uh, when the wind isn't blowing. They'll uh, soak it up all night long and uh, emit it uh, during the day. Uh, we can't go on uh, using uh, oil, gas, and other forms of fuel which uh, create CO2 because the earth uh, can't handle it. They can't handle the CO2 and it can't handle the pollution. So. Anyway, that's why we need offshore wind. Uh, there is more power offshore than the wind onshore. Uh, there are uh, studies and uh, reports that uh, there's 40 uh, atomic plants worth of energy in the wind in the Gulf of Maine. 40 atomic power plants worth of wind. Uh, we haven't learned how to uh, dispose of uh, nuclear waste yet, except by uh, tipping uh, arms with uh, depleted uranium and spreading it all over Kosovo and the Middle East. Uh, that is not an answer. Uh, that's one of the reasons why they haven't moved forward with the Yucca Mountain, because they found a way to get rid of our nuclear waste. Just perpetual wars and uh, blast the hell out of uh, shock and awe countries with uh, depleted uranium. So, what will be some of the challenges of actually going out there and setting these things up? How realistic? Yeah, I mean, that's a loaded question, but it's uh, on the uh, on the scale of putting a, a human being on the moon and returning him. There's that much uh, science, engineering, and. Uh, commitment to uh, an idea that's needed to do that. Uh, that is the most hostile environment on Earth, except inside a volcano. You've got extremes of weather. Uh, you've got uh, extremes of energy forces uh, and waves and wind. And uh, you have ice. 
On the Gulf of Maine, you have ice. And the turbines that float out in deep water will have on them. Only friendly, produced by wind power, assisted by maybe fish oils and different coatings on the uh, blades. The stability of putting something as large as a destroyer on end floating uh, and trying to get it to be a stable, non-pitch poling tower uh, is going to require a lot of engineering below the surface and possibly uh, energy transfer from the nacelle, which is the, the, uh, the generator on top, transfer of that power to a generator which acts as a gyro on the base of the tower as one form of stability, kind of like a se uh, Segway. So. How do they get the power from the offshore? Like I assume there'll be like, we're, we're picturing many, many turbines out there. Yeah, submerged uh, uh, transmission lines, so be about yay big around. Yeah, so there's a power line from the water, uh, from the wind power plant out there that runs into shore. That's right. How far and offshore are they planned? They're 20. Uh, the prototypes uh, will probably be within uh, sight of land, but the proposed uh, larger wind farms, the, uh, the ones that uh, will be permanent, uh, will be 25 miles offshore. So They'll be over the horizon. See them? That's one of the considerations. And that's an aesthetic. As an aesthetic, uh, they can't place them everywhere off there because there are certain breeding grounds for whales. Uh, there are certain uh, uh, fishing grounds, uh, and there are certain shipping lanes. So that's one of the. Uh, there are many of the considerations uh, for sighting. How submerged will the uh, transmission lines be? Well. They have to be submerged. They may have to be submerged, and uh, on the bottom, but it may rest on the bottom. And I'm a scuba diver. Yeah. I, I scallop dive, and where we go are transmission lines, because the scallops are attracted to the electromagnetic field. So. <laughs> But well, you know, it's, it's something to consider. Uh, is this a good thing or is it a bad thing? So how many turbines are we talking in order? I mean, it's going to cost a lot of money to even start the program, do the engineering, and then buy the hardware and set it up, and all the mechanics and all the. Well, the University of the University of Maine has is receiving grants from. Uh, the government, the United States government, uh, from uh, Maine Technologies Institute, and is being funded also by uh, a bond issue that was recently passed by the Maine State Legislature uh, to build the prototypes, engineer the prototypes of these uh, uh, wind farms and to place them out in the uh, Gulf of Maine, maybe three of them, maybe five of them, but to see what works. Is it 300 or 500? No, no it's, it's three or, or five, you know. He's talking about 500 out No, the, this is the prototypes. To see what works and what doesn't work. And the University of Maine, uh, <laughs> under the direction of Habib Dagger, is uh, doing this. So. But they haven't talked about, like, there's a certain break point where economically it's, you have to make it big enough to make it worth all the effort to run the lines and to 
into put either one out there, I mean, you're going to have to put probably hundreds, right? Is that what you're talking about? Well, they, they yeah, 500 to 1,000. Yeah, so and this is all like consolidated in, in, a, in one area out there? They no. Spread out? Are they spread out? There are many different sites being considered, but probably only five sites um, at most. So there'll be, there'll be sites where there's a lot of them and four or five of these sites? There's only uh, uh, so many places that a, a marine cable can come ashore. And we want it to come ashore in Maine. Uh, but that requires uh, a grid that can handle the, the, all these different types of uh, alternative energy. I'm still, I'm still concerned about the transmission line. So you had four or five different sites, each cutting about 50 to 60 or 100. 25 miles of cable this big. It's a transmission line that has to be interconnected among it. It's a one big transmission line going under the sea all the way up. Right. It's DC, high voltage DC power. That's what they, uh, they want. Is it true that uh, you, you were not sure about whether it would be submerged or what? What would be the alternative? No, they, they've, they've talked about plowing uh, the cable under in the sediments, which uh, I, I'm not for that, uh, being... Uh, <laughs> the, the thing that occurs to me is, uh, have, they, have they figured out the net gain in terms of energy? Because a lot of energy is going to be needed just to support the production of it. That's and right. That's right. It's mind boggling. <laughs> Impossible. But you're uh, arguing for it. <laughs> I am. I am arguing uh, for uh, doing something rather than doing nothing. But once all this infrastructure would be there, it could go on forever. It's not like well, you have to maintain the, uh, you know, and maintenance costs will be high. And uh, they, they're talking about uh, doing some of the maintenance offshore uh, with ships that are designed to take in uh, these floating wind towers and being able to take off a prop if it needs a new prop uh, or blades or whatever, uh, and to change a nacelle, uh, which is the generator on top with all the brakes and clutches and everything else uh, and de-icers and, you know, so there's a lot of maintenance involved. How tall will these towers be and how wide are the blades? Have they talked about that a lot? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the blade width, uh, I don't have a figure, but the, uh, the blade length, 150 feet. 350 or, foot blades per Yeah, foot. yeah it's a 300 foot diameter swing. And the above ground would, uh, or above water, would handle that so the blades uh, weren't uh, hitting uh, waves of any great height. But there'll probably be more uh, length of the, the floating spar or superstructure under the water than above the water. So you're talking each unit being longer than a Aegis destroyer. So how, what's happening in Denmark or other countries that are farther ahead in? Well, they've already got uh, uh, offshore wind uh, not floating. They're, they're doing that this summer, but uh, they have uh, uh, wind towers that are supported uh, with the, the fr from the bedrock up out there and 
relatively shallow water. Uh, there's, <clears throat> I have some pictures. If I can go get them. I've been watching for years the military try to figure out how it's going to shoot a bullet with a bullet, right? Um, for the missile defense system. So we've been watching. Lots of money get poured into lots of different companies to do the brainstorming, the research and development, the testing, et cetera, et cetera, um, to protect ourselves from an enemy that doesn't exist. So as far as I'm concerned, um, and they've made progress with this impossible task of hit, shooting a bullet with a bullet. So as far as I'm concerned, um, it's about you know where do you want to put your focused energy and attention? Are we there's no way we're going to be able to afford missile defense and a renewable energy infrastructure. So unless we, um, from my perspective as a populist, um, begin to articulate the vision that we want to see for 2050, um, you know, it seems to me that's an important step to, to all of this, that we need to articulate um, a desire for the research and development to happen for this infrastructure, whether it's offshore wind or whatever, but it needs to be part of the American conversation, it seems. Sorry we're, to interrupt, Peter. We're spending, uh, as of 2007, uh, a year on the United States military uh, for Rhode Island, for Massachusetts. Uh, we're not alone. There is a race going on produce the offshore wind farms uh, and site them uh, along different coasts uh, and have the jobs go to different states. Uh, Maine, especially uh, in the marine gone off on an easy, uh, inexpensive uh, use of oil to, uh, as far as energy, an energy policy which uh, centered around oil. Uh, we might have been into alternative energy a lot sooner. I'll pass this around. This is the first working self-sustaining wind tower in the United States that lasted for 20 years and generated electricity and it was built in 1888. Oh <laughs> Companies, uh, or they have factories in, in, in the United States and Colorado uh, and around the world. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in the news recently uh, was a plant that was in the Isle of Wight in the in England uh, because they weren't building they didn't have the demand that the, the Vestas the Danish company wanted to see so they closed the company down the workers took it over on July 20th and 21st and staged a protest that uh, we want the jobs here um, and made, made a point to the, the government that uh, you know, you've got to s start producing more uh, wind towers and offshore stuff for this company to stay here in England. They said they can make more money in America. This is a private Danish firm that's doing this. Yeah, this Vestas. They like said they, uh, the reason is they can make more money in the United States. Are they the, currently the global leader in this field? They're the global leader. They're the ones that are doing offshore uh, testing this summer.
And how long have they been going? Uh, they built their first uh, wind tower in 1979. So they've, uh, they are uh, the longest running uh, wind power company going. 30 years. The meter maid is ticketing cars over here if anyone's parked there along right. um, Main, Main Street. Right How about right, right here? You're all right here, but if you're over here, I would check the car if you've been there more than two hours. Oh, is that a two hour limit? It's, it's a two hour limit. Wow. Sorry, Peter, to interrupt you. Do you happen to know uh, if in Denmark, I suppose it's, it's mostly in Denmark that, that do you know the percentage of energy that, that they're using with this? Well, uh, the island, the uh, SAMSO, the island that became energy, uh, sustainable energy, there was their dominant uh, uh -huh. energy, uh, is supporting themselves on geothermal and uh, wind power. Yeah. That's what they're they're doing. So. Can I add to that, Peter? Um, Denmark said in the late 70s, uh, early 80s, when, at the last oil crisis, in this 1970s oil crisis, Denmark set a goal that within 20 years, they would have 20% of their energy created through wind power, and they met that goal. Um, and now they want 40%, I think, I want to say by the year 2020. Um, they, made, they met that goal sooner than they had anticipated doing it. And there's this, there's a report out um, that's really, it's a fascinating study because it said, it talks about how in those days, um, as Denmark, their approach was to provide money to local communities to generate small prototypes and try them out, uh, learn from each other, sort of figure out what works, what doesn't, and then to kind of build on successes until they generated what they needed for their community. These were farmers. Oh yeah. Yeah. Developing their own their own systems. Their own systems. I mean, there were engineers and yeah. stuff. But yeah. They were basically farmers that had lots of land, and uh, uh, they wanted to do something. Uh, other than use uh, nuclear power or oil. So it, was a, it really was sort of a government incentive, a government-run program to generate an alternative way to be, and they provided the local support, and it really worked beautifully for them, so they now are the world leaders. At the same time, as I, under, as I read the story, the United States put, gave, um, I want to say Boeing, billions to kind of generate a, a windmill prototype and so they constructed this huge monstrosity on land that just their prototype failed right away. And, um, and so that was it. So they said, okay, it doesn't work, work. it's what over, da da da. Um, I have the report. It was, again, it was after the oil crisis. So I want to say in the early 80s. Um, Stephen Schofield, S C H O F I E L D, he did a report um, that sort of looked at the conversion movement and where it's been and sort of talked about sort of what has worked uh, in the past. So anyway, it's a good report. I'm going to jump down to the bottom. We have uh, engineering obstacles uh, and infrastructure obstacles to any sustainable power uh, on a big scale in Maine. We have a 40-year-old grid that can't handle uh, the intermittent quality of sustainable energy. Unless everybody has their own windmill or solar panels or uh, geothermal uh, drill uh, into the ground, uh, which uh, lets uh, people uh, rent out of picture. Uh, we're going to need to uh, revamp the grid at a tune of about four or five billion dollars in the state of Maine. Okay. Let's move on.
How will offshore wind farms uh, impact the environment? Well, last winter, last fall, we had an unusual event. Uh, an unusually large pod of endangered bright whales. 150 miles uh, uh, south of uh, Acadia. Something that they hadn't seen before. So, uh, are these cables and structures out from the Gulf going to affect whales? Will the electromagnetic field off these affect whales? We don't know. Uh, the main, uh, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute and the University of Maine uh, are looking into uh, these whale sightings and the effects on on whales and other uh, uh, marine organisms. What would it what, it, what does it do to plankton? Does it kill plankton? We don't know. Before we rush into this, uh, a lot of people are getting involved with uh, doing the research on this. And that in itself uh, provides some jobs in Maine. Are there any questions that haven't been answered yet? Oh, what kind of jobs? Uh, and who is interested in getting these jobs? Well, Bath Ironworks for sure. They have stated that they, if they put anything out in the Gulf of Maine, that they want a part of it. Chimbro Corporation already is the first corporation that broke ground on, in June, putting several, uh, putting three wind towers out on Vinyl Haven. And there are the first offshore uh, wind towers to go up because they're out there, but they're not floating. And they're very interested in doing that type of work too because uh, they have done oil rigs, which are similar. So, the projection, uh, if this gets underway, or when this gets underway, of producing uh, or creating 15 to 30,000 industry related jobs in Maine. How many? 15 to 30,000 industry related jobs. That's manufacturing, construction, that's. Uh, yeah, the whole thing. These are, uh, it could say Chinbro, it could say Reed and Reed. I happen to work for Bath Ironworks. So if you want any, they're right here. I would like to build or be part of the uh, offshore wind industry at Bath Ironworks. And they have shown interest in doing other things other than building their core product.